12,000 years ago, Heidelin's war against Zodiac tore the world into 14 pieces and plunged humanity into a perpetual dark age. Each piece of the fractured world was possessed by a shard of Heidelin within and a shard of Zodiac without, pound in the moon. Although these shards or reflections of the source are separate and unique, they are bound by an etheric connection. But then why can't someone on the source see or interact with other shards? Or the shards with each other? The diagram of the shards we saw in the ocular made it easy to understand that they are separate from the source. But it was only one interpretation. We know that travel between the shards is difficult, even under the best of circumstances. Though the rift separating the shards is very small, it is still incredibly dangerous to traverse, and there have only been two instances of individuals crossing with their bodies and souls intact. While all the shards are separate, they still occupy the same space. They are not another planet, but exist on a different frequency of the ethereal plane. If we were to see the planet from space, we would only see one world, the other shards unable to be perceived at the wavelengths the universe exists in. But if we could perceive all the shards and the ethereal wavelengths they reside in, this is another interpretation of what they might look like, spread out to their respective wavelengths. No, the worlds are not flat, but it serves to illustrate my point. Another, more familiar comparison might be to the real-world light spectrum, were we to take the full spectrum and cut it into 14 pieces. All the pieces would still coexist with each other, despite being separate and unique. Each of these fragments would include a piece of the ethereal spectrum. Not all would hold the balances equally. But despite containing a piece of etheric spectrum, it would not have others, and would not be able to interact with objects without an etheric frequency within its given range. For example, the first was more susceptible to light ether, because much of the ether on its spectrum was heavily umbral. This is something referred to as a discrete spectrum. When heated, we can see the discrete spectrum of unique elements in a spectrograph. Here are some of the spectrums unique to the elements of sodium, hydrogen, calcium, and mercury. Some of these spectrums overlap in some areas, but for the most part, they occupy unique fragments of the continuous spectrum, much like the shards of the source. But there is one other waveform apart from light that discrete spectrums apply to. Sound. Final Fantasy XIV is extremely heavy with references to sound, from the echo, to the sound of the final days, to the resonant, and the symphony the echo used to be, the game is riddled with references to the importance that sound plays. From this perspective, it would be reasonable to assume that Zodiac rewrote the rules of creation using something called destructive wave interference, which would have, temporarily at least, cancelled out the waveform of the sound that allowed it to manifest. Heidelin Sundering, similarly, could have used a form of subtractive, constructive interference that resulted in 14 much smaller waveforms with the same modulation. Rejoinings would be constructive interferences, as seen here, with complementary waveforms joining to create a larger wave. Once split off from the source, Despite only having a fragment of ethereal spectrum across all elements, the worlds still coalesced into fully functional ecosystems, complete with their own ethereal balances and life streams. This can be explained similar to how a magnet, once broken, will immediately create a north and south pole for each piece of the magnet, as the magnet must contain both a north and south pole in order to function. There are theories about monopole magnets in quantum physics, however, at this time, they are purely theoretical. If we think about the world pre-sundering as a beam of white light, Heidelin essentially acted as a prism, splitting that light into an array of distinct colors. In the Astrologian questline, we learn that astrologians draw their power from the ether of distant stars. Koji Fox confirmed this in a 2018 interview, in which he stated that even a faraway planet or sun will still have a minute amount of gravitational pull and affect other planets. On the source, the etheric wavelength is identical to that of the rest of the universe, which is why Midgard, Sormer, and Omega found the source, and not any of the shards. For the best example of this, 
One need only look to the night sky on the source. The sky is filled with stars, and we can see the core of the galaxy stretching across the night. The source is in tune with the rest of the universe. However, when we do the same on the first, we see a night sky that is far more empty. There are far fewer stars, and there is no galactic band. The first etheric wavelength does not include most of the stars in the universe, and so the ether and light of distant stars is invisible to those who live there. The astrologian constellations emit a full spectrum of ether, as it would make sense to be able to play the job on any shard were we to travel there. Or someone from the first to hop into a spaceship and go to space, I expect they would find it very empty, as their etheric wavelength only matches a small fraction of the rest of the universe. And so, for them, the majority of the universe simply does not exist.